I had the privilege of putting this presentation together for Adobe Max 2020, which was the first ever virtual Adobe Max. If you're thinking of adding motion design to your toolkit, this video is for you, and I hope you enjoy it. Look to your right, now to your left. One of those people won't make it out of this presentation alive. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Howdy, my name is Joey Kornman and I've been a motion designer for 15 years. I've worked on all kinds of projects, commercials, explainer videos, TV shows, digital campaigns, and along the way I've worked as a staff animator, I have freelanced, I've run a studio in Boston, Massachusetts, and I've even taught motion design at one of those fancy art schools. These days, I run School of Motion, an online school that teaches artists from all over the world the ways of motion design. In short, and I am short, I'm kind of obsessed with motion design. So in this presentation, I will teach you some of the basics of motion design and show you why it's an incredible time to add motion to your toolkit. I'll also go over the process that I use when designing for motion, teach you some basic principles of animation to get you started, talk about how to make money doing motion design, and show you how to get started if any of this actually sounds like fun. Sound good? Great. Let's start by answering a really easy question. What is motion design? If you're older than 30, you may have heard the term MoGraph, which is short for motion graphics. In ye olden days, that is what people used to call the animated stuff that you'd see on commercials and film title sequences. That term, though it does evoke a certain nostalgia in certain crowds, isn't as widely used anymore. Now we say motion design, and what the heck is motion design? Okay, this is not actually an easy question. In fact, I bet if you asked 100 motion designers this question, you'd get 200 answers, and how is that possible? Plugins. When I used to get asked to define motion design, I used to say something corny and vague, like, imagine if you stuck a designer and an animator in a blender. <laughs> Unfortunately, that sounds kind of dangerous, and it doesn't conjure up a very pleasing image, so then I went the other way and I'd say something boring like, it's two parts graphic design, one part animation, and three parts conceptual thinking. That, my friends, is a terrible description of anything, and it doesn't really capture it either. So what if we don't define motion design as one thing or one field, but instead say, wait for it, motion design is a collection of overlapping skills, a tool set that can include graphic design, animation, visual effects, editing, 2D and 3D illustrations, interactive design, and even augmented and virtual reality. These tools allow you to communicate a message through the magical combination of design and motion. Hence, motion design. If you're ever hired to do motion design, what you're actually doing depends a lot on who's hiring you to do it, but we'll get into that more a bit later. First, let's talk about the motion design process. Now, I'm assuming you're already in a creative field, so some of this will be very, very familiar to you, which is a good thing, because motion design doesn't have to be hard to get into. We're really just taking the creative process and adding a new dimension to it, time. Being that this is Adobe Max, you're probably thinking that motion design happens mostly inside of Adobe After Effects. You know, that app that you opened that one time and then panicked and then closed it and then hid in the bathroom eating an entire sleeve of Oreos, which I've definitely never done. But the truth is that the process of making motion design is very similar to every other kind of design out there. It takes planning, it takes a process, iteration, polishing, things like that. The same way that knowing Photoshop doesn't make you a designer, Knowing After Effects doesn't make you an animator. The secret is in the process. And here's the process in five easy steps. Of course, the process is different for every project. Sometimes you can skip steps, sometimes there's extra steps, but in general, this is the format I like to follow. So why don't we look at an example of a project? Every project starts with some sort of brief, and in this case, the brief came from me. This was an internal project for School of Motion, and the brief went like this. Create a short intro for the video course, The Path to MoGraph, which covers the basics of motion design. 
The intro should touch on the themes and techniques taught in the class while leading the viewer on a journey. If you've ever worked for or at an ad agency, by the way, this may have triggered you. What with the vague, bland, mealy mouthness of this generic brief. But in truth, this is often what we're given as creatives and it's up to us to fill in the gaps. Which brings us to step one, building out a concept. Every creative has a different process for coming up with ideas. One of my favorite techniques is called mind mapping. If you've never tried it, it's basically a free association exercise. You start with a basic idea. In this case, it's the name of the video course I'm creating an intro for, The Path to MoGraph. Then you start riffing on that core idea. So what if I take the word MoGraph and type out the first thing that pops into my head? I think of software, which makes me think of all the Adobe apps I use in my work, but MoGraph also makes me think of techniques like animation and design principles, drawing, 3D. I could also riff on the word path, which makes me think of a literal path, so maybe you need directions, and directions are for going from A to B. Maybe you need a map, ooh, maybe you're on a tour, like a path that takes you on a tour through a motion design project, neat. But a path could also be a technical thing, like a path you draw inside of Illustrator or Photoshop, and those paths can have strokes and dashes and other designy things. They can animate and almost act like a trail or a map. And all of these ideas start to connect together into something that triggers a visual concept in my brain. And that is why mind mapping is useful. You uncover as many ideas as possible, making sure to get the bad ones out of the way to discover some that actually work. And you generally end up with a specific idea that would have been a challenge to conjure up without doing all of that work. Next, I like to take that concept and blow it out into thumbnail sketches. As you will see in about Five seconds. I am not a great illustrator, but this is actually a good thing. It forces me to ignore the prettiness of the design and to just focus on the overall concept and story that I'm telling. Riffing on this tour of a motion design project idea, I figured I'd start in a very meta way by drawing a pencil and paper, which could in turn be drawing something. The logo is what we need to end up with, so maybe the pencil sketch version of it animates on first. Then we follow a path into the digital world where a cursor could be tweaking shapes and making things more precise. I started sketching in elements from the apps I use to do motion design and trying to vary the compositions in each shot. Some are wide, some are close up. I don't have every single transition and beat thought out fully, but I'm starting to find a thread to get from pencil and paper to Illustrator to After Effects all the way through to final render. And here's where I ended up. I know underwhelming, but it's a start, a blueprint for the next step where we make it pretty. Step two, style frames and design boards. If you're already a designer, this part is old hat to you. The only thing that's really different here is that your designs will eventually be moving. So you have to think about how you get from one frame to the next and how technically difficult the animation will be to execute. The design stage is where you figure out exactly what your piece will look like. What's the art direction? How big are things in the frame? How much detail is there? In the end, you'll create a set of design boards, essentially storyboards that are designed to give the animator a visual guide for the important moments in the animation. For these boards, I used a combination of stock imagery, screen grabs from After Effects and Illustrator, shape layers, and other built from scratch elements, and I used my crappy storyboards as the blueprint to build out every frame. It took a while, but here's where I ended up. Ta-da! By the way, don't say ta-da when you present work to your clients. For some reason, it's frowned upon. Now, there's a cool thing about these boards that you may not have noticed. When you get some practice doing this, you'll be able to design boards that imply animation. If we flip through the boards in a sequence, it almost looks like stuff is moving, and your brain kind of fills in the gaps. This is very, very helpful for the next step, which is... Step three, making an animatic. You may have never seen that word before, animatic. It sounds a little dangerous, but don't worry. It's a simple concept, but a very powerful tool. See, here's the thing. You now have these beautiful boards that spell out how you want the animation to look and what the story is going to be, but you don't really have any idea how long each shot needs to be on screen, how long things are gonna take to move from A to B. What's the pacing gonna be like? How about music? I was told there'd be music. These are all decisions that editors are used to making. And like I mentioned earlier, editing is part of the motion design bag of tools. So the animatic stage is where we roughly edit together these boards to music to figure out the general pacing and timing of the piece. I do this in Premiere and I try to keep it really simple. 
I'll cut the boards together to figure out roughly how long I think the animation needs to be. Then I'll pick some music and start cutting it together to find a nice rhythm, a nice little build up with payoff. I'll tweak the timing until I'm happy and then here is where we end up. Now, at long last, we get to open up After Effects and actually make things move. And it's going to be so much easier to do now that we have a really detailed scaffolding for what the animation is supposed to be. We know what it should look like. We know roughly how long each shot needs to last, how much time it should take to transition. We're ready to go to step four, production. I call this step production because it may involve live action, animation, more editing, voiceover recording, anything necessary to put it all together. In this project, all I needed was After Effects and a few plugins and some experience using the principles of animation, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now, inside of After Effects, I'm using my design boards and my animatic as guides and building the entire animation from start to finish using a variety of tools. I'm using shape tools, I'm bringing in images that I've captured, stock imagery, and even using parts of the Photoshop file I built while doing the boards. One fancier element is this pencil, which I wanted to feel more realistic than everything else, so I used a 3D model of a pencil and a plugin called Element 3D to animate that sucker directly inside of After Effects. I spent a lot of time tying different scenes together through similar movements, a concept I like to call reinforcing motion. It's a great way to keep energy moving throughout a piece like this, though it can take some finessing to get it just right. I also used something called a luminance mat to make the final logo reveal seem a little more analog. There are images or videos that contain luminance or brightness information that you can use in a million different ways inside of After Effects. And at the end of it all, I have a beautiful timeline with all of my shots laid out in sequence. And in a minute, you'll get to see what it looks like. But first, step five, finishing. We need to add the finishing touches to this masterpiece. That's pretentious. I usually do this step back in Premiere. First, making sure the music is edited perfectly, trying to get as much drama out of it as I can. Then I do some sound design, using various libraries to build up a soundtrack that syncs with different beats, movements, and transitions. For this piece, I even recorded the sound of a pencil dropping and rolling across the table so I could time things out perfectly with the animation. Then I do some mixing, a little light mastering, double check everything, and time for the big reveal. So maybe that intro animation didn't just change your life. Or did it? In any case, it's a real and very common example of the types of things motion designers are asked to do. The process may have seemed a little over-engineered or cumbersome at times, but I can tell you from experience that even simple projects like this one require a strong process, especially when you get clients involved and have to manage all of this while getting approvals along the way. I also hope that there were some animated moments in that intro that you thought were cool, where the movement really helped propel the piece forward and to keep you engaged. Animating can be pretty technical, but creating the movement that does those things I just described, that's basically the art of animation. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. I mentioned earlier that being good at Photoshop does not mean someone is a good designer. And hopefully it's obvious why that's the case. But I do find that artists who want to start incorporating motion into their work often fall prey to the idea that the tool you use is the most important thing. So let me smack that out of you right now and um, don't tell HR. <laughs> Animation is an art and there are principles behind that art. Often animators are taught that there are 12 principles of animation, but a bunch of those principles only apply when you're talking about hand-drawn animation or character animation. One of the best After Effects animators out there is Jorge Estrada, who runs Ordinary Folk in Vancouver. He came up with these 10 principles of animation that are geared towards motion designers. I think he's onto something, and I wanna teach you three of these principles so that you can use them for sport and profit when you start down the road to motion. That was a terrible sentence. Before we get to the principles, I need to make sure that you know what this word means. 
Keyframe. What's a keyframe? Well, to help illustrate the concept, we're going to need your new best friend, After Effects, and this little dot. Let's say you have a design element, the dot, and you want some aspect of that dot to change over time. A simple example would be changing the position of the dot. To do this, we open up the position property of that dot and set a keyframe, basically a store of the dot's position value on the very first frame of animation. Then, we can move our playhead forward in time, say one second, and change the position of the dot. You'll notice a second keyframe has automatically been created on the position property. Now, one second of animation in this particular project is actually 30 frames, 30 individual pictures that will, eventually, play back so fast it'll trick your eye into thinking there's motion. You're probably at least a little familiar with that concept, but the point I wanna make is this. When we hit the play button, that dot will now move over 30 frames of animation. But we only defined what that dot is doing on two frames, the first and the last frame of movement. And those frames that we, the animators, defined are called key frames. Key frames. Almost all animation in After Effects is determined by keyframes, which let After Effects know how you want your composition to look on this frame and this frame. And after that, the magical computer machine will figure out all the rest of the frames for you. Sort of. More on that in a second. To really get the most bang for your buck out of keyframes, you need to understand the two most important concepts in animation. And they are timing and spacing. Timing is pretty easy to get. Remember our little dot friend? And I guess he needs a name. How about Elliot? So we gave Elliot two keyframes on his position property. Those keyframes were set one second apart, creating a movement that takes exactly one second. So the timing of this move is one second. Pretty easy, right? Now let's move on to spacing, which is where a lot of the magic happens. Watching this animation play a few times, you're probably noticing that it feels very stiff and robotic. Maybe sometimes that's what you want, but I think Elliot would be much happier and confident in his dotness if he moved in a more interesting way. First though, let me explain why he's moving in such a stiff manner right now. If I select the two keyframes and then click on this button, After Effects can show me a graph of Elliot's position as it changes over time. Notice that the graph is a straight line that goes up and to the right telling us that the X position is changing the exact same amount on every single frame in a linear manner, which is why these keyframes here are called linear keyframes. If you've used After Effects before, you may have discovered a function that makes these keyframes a bit more interesting. It's called Easy Ease. If I select these two keyframes, right click them, go to Keyframe Assistant, and then click Easy Ease, something has happened to our graph. When I play the animation now, you should notice a pretty drastic difference. Elliot the Dot is moving much more naturally, taking some time to pick up speed, and then requiring a little time at the end to slow down. There's a sense of physics being in play now, and it's just sort of more interesting. But notice that even though Elliot seems to be moving faster in the middle of this animation, the keyframes are still only one second apart. The timing hasn't changed, something else has. To clear up what's going on here, let's look at the original linear keyframe version of the animation. If we take all 30 frames of this movement and overlay them on top of each other, you can see that the spacing between each frame is consistent. But when we used that easy ease command, it changed the spacing between each frame. The spacing is more bunched up at the beginning and the end, and more spread out in the middle. When frames are closer together, it feels like Elliot's moving slower. And when things are further apart, Elliot's moving faster. The spacing is what's being affected here, but the timing remains unchanged. You can really exaggerate the spacing in animation, getting more contrast between the slow and fast parts of a movement. And this is a great way to make animation more appealing. Same timing, different spacing, completely different feels between these three options. And now you know the difference between timing and spacing, which quite honestly, I didn't know until I'd been animating for about five years. Using good timing and spacing in your animations can take you really far. But of course, you probably wanna learn a few other tricks. So let's talk about, wait for it, wait for it, anticipation. See what I did there? 
Okay, let's talk about anticipation. When Elliot the Dot moves from left to right with some nice spacing, it feels good. But we're not giving the viewer any hints that something important is about to happen, and this can sometimes make movements feel abrupt. Notice the way the animation graph looks right now. Reading it from left to right, you can see that it's flat at the beginning and the end while Elliot is picking up speed or decelerating. And it's steepest in the middle where he's gotten up to speed. I'm gonna tweak this graph a bit and I want you to try and predict what will happen when the animation plays back. I'm gonna add another keyframe towards the beginning of the movement and I'm going to tell Elliot to move in the opposite direction just briefly before moving to the right. Notice that the graph now has a little dip in it and when we play the animation, there's a nice little head fake before the main move happens. In animation, we call this an anticipation and now that you're aware of it, you'll see it everywhere. Every cartoon you have ever watched uses this technique extensively. And if anticipation is peanut butter, overshoots are marshmallow fluff. What if we added an extra keyframe at the end of the animation, symmetrical to what we did in the beginning, like this? Now, Elliot the Dot, in his youthful eagerness, goes a little too far and has to settle back once he reaches the end of the movement. This is called an overshoot, and it really helps to make your animation feel like there are some physical rules that it follows. Many of the principles you'll learn about if you start doing animation are there to help you make your movements feel more natural. Human beings are used to seeing things move in real life, and when we see animations, it tends to just feel a little better when what we're seeing follows similar physical rules. Which brings us to the last principle I wanted to show you. Follow through also known as overlapping action. This concept is, again, designed to mimic the way things move in the real world. If I flap my arms up and down like some sort of deranged eagle, probably a bald eagle, you'll notice that my arms, like most arms, have joints. The flapping motion may begin at my shoulder, but then it travels down my arm, hitting the elbow and the wrist and finally my fingers, and there's a bit of a delay as the movement travels down the chain, giving my flaps a wave-like appearance. And you'll see this everywhere if you're looking for it. When things move, most of the time the entire thing doesn't move simultaneously. There's a bit of a lag. In After Effects, the easiest way to demonstrate how this works is to invite Elliot's bandmates to help out. Layla, Emmeline, Elliot, and Danny Carey are in a progressive metal band. They call their fans Dot Folk, it's a whole thing. But anyway, right now, all four dots are moving exactly the same way at exactly the same time. Nothing in real life moves like this, so to make these actions overlap, all we need to do is shift the keyframes for each dot so that the movements have some delay between them. If I shift the keyframes over by one frame of animation for each dot, it now looks like this. That wave-like motion I mentioned is already very clear, and we can exaggerate it more and make this feel a bit looser and more stretchy by adding another frame of overlap. Follow through can get much more complex than this, but the basic idea is extremely simple to execute and adds instant visual appeal to almost any animation. And now, you know how to do it. Come to think of it. You actually know quite a bit now, so let's talk about how one goes about getting paid to do motion design. The number of companies who need motion design in one form or another has grown exponentially since I started my career. You've got motion design studios, traditionally found in large and medium-sized markets, but actually more and more found everywhere. And these types of companies often attract top talent and do some of the most creative work. You've got tech companies who have been scooping up motion designers as fast as they can be minted, and by the way, paying them a lot. And the work they need done is usually pretty different than what a studio needs. At Google, for example, motion designers might work on interactions that happen inside of an app, or even on a physical device. Pretty cool. And then you've got everybody else who does anything, and I'm serious, companies you would never imagine doing motion design have multiple motion designers on staff. Real estate companies, colleges, startups, car companies, cable networks, product companies. School of Motion alumni work at more than 5,000 companies all over the world. 5,000? Can you name 5,000 of anything? Anyway, my point is this. Earlier in this presentation, I suggested that maybe we should think of motion design as a set of skills, not a specific discipline. 
And if you think about it this way, the number of job opportunities or clients you can work with becomes practically infinite. We live in an age where everything is on a screen, and if it's on a screen, it's likely moving, and if it's moving, a motion designer made it move. So how much can you make doing motion design? This, of course, depends on a lot of variables, but we've done surveys in the past at School of Motion, and I want to share some of the data with you. Our most recent survey seemed to confirm that the US market is still dominant in motion design, and subsequently, artists tend to earn a bit more than in other countries. Canada, the UK, Australia, and many countries in Western Europe also have healthy and growing motion design markets. And you'll find thriving motion design communities in parts of South America, all over Asia, and even in emerging markets in Africa. Freelancing is extremely common in motion design, and it does seem like the average freelancer brings home a bit more than a full-timer, although of course there are trade-offs to that. However, if you like the digital nomad freelance artist lifestyle, that is definitely a thing in motion design. And if you are the super ambitious type, this next data point might be interesting to you. Motion design is, even after a few decades, still a new field. From what I can see, it hasn't been commoditized the way that some other creative fields have, and even with the advent of sites like Upwork and Fiverr that service the lower end of the budget spectrum, there's significant financial upside if you can serve your clients well. The highest paid person on staff who filled out our survey, and I'm guessing that this person is an owner, made $360,000 in their best year. The highest paid freelancer we surveyed reported a one year haul of $300,000. I know those numbers may sound ridiculous and they are certainly not typical, but they are real. And motion design is still a great industry for artists that like to hustle. And so, if you're still with me, you might be wondering how to get started. I'm gonna keep it simple. Step one, open After Effects and play around with it. Since you're watching this Adobe Max presentation, you likely already have, or at least have access to an Adobe Creative Cloud account. So start playing around with timing, spacing, anticipation, and the other tricks I showed you today. And it's gonna be pretty uncomfortable at first, you know, like going too heavy on the Tiger Balm. But like anything else, you'll get the hang of it and start to see just how approachable animation can be. Step two, practice. You may not have clients paying you to do motion design right away, but that should not stop you from making stuff. Animating is like any other skill. You can have the tool, but if you don't practice with it, you won't be very good. There are lots of great resources out there to help you learn and practice motion design. And you can take advantage of any or all of them. Step three, once you're comfortable doing simple motion design, put together a portfolio. Nobody, and I mean nobody, cares how you learn to do motion design. You don't need a degree or a resume. You need a portfolio of work, even if it's all student work or personal projects. Everybody starts somewhere, and your first portfolio will look nothing like the portfolio you have in five years. So use Behance or take advantage of that Adobe portfolio account and put something together. Step four, never stop learning. Motion design, software, technology, and even techniques are being improved and invented all the time. There are new tools out there that make it easier to add animation to software, new renderers to make 3D animation easier and faster, and plugins that can automate really tedious tasks so you have more time to be creative. You can plug into motion design communities on social media, through friends, or even through structured programs like School of Motion to keep your finger on the pulse of the industry. This isn't a field where you can rest on your laurels. You need to embrace the process of growth and get out there and go get after it! Yeah! Sorry. And step five, thank you very much. I know that's not a step, but thank you for watching this presentation. I hope I was able to transfer to you some of the passion that I have for motion design. The field is just an incredibly welcoming place and there's always a new challenge. And from what I'm seeing, there's also plenty of work. So good luck and happy keyframing. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more motion design content and check out the rest of the Adobe Max 2020 presentations at the link in the description.